Hi, Fred. My name is Josh Shell, host of the Let's Start a Cult podcast, the only podcast that uses its advertising money to build a secluded compound in an undisclosed location. Now, with that out of the way, let me introduce to you my guest this episode. That's right, we only have one guest this episode because all the other guests are obviously building the compound. So my guest today is the host of the Jury Room podcast, an incredible true crime podcast that focuses on serial killers, missing persons, and so much more. Please welcome Kevin Cook. Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm great, Josh. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. Awesome. So could you uh, give our listeners maybe a little bit of a taste of what they can expect going into the Jury Room podcast? Absolutely. So our very first episode, we covered Ed Kemper himself, which I took inspiration. If anybody listens to it, there's a part where I kind of pause that he used to hang out with officers and drink at a bar in Santa Barbara, California at the jury room. So that's kind of where I got my, the name from the inspiration to take that, you know, considering that I was going to cover true crime. Now I don't cover just serial killers. A few episodes later, I covered a few unsolved cases, the icebox murders. I covered an unsolved case out of the UK. And then just a couple of episodes later, I interviewed a detective who was retired from somewhere in Florida. (laughs) I interviewed her and she was a a great, you know, a great interview. She really focused on the mental health aspect of, you know, the first responders and such, Mm -hmm. you know, and then my most recent episode that just released, I interviewed a Scotland Yard undercover detective and that was interesting. The the guy has got a lot to say and if you just sit and let him talk, he'll talk your your ear off. So (laughs) that's always the best. Right. It's kind of where it's going. I want to mix it up. I've got some upcoming episodes that I feel like are going to really be good. I got John Benet Ramsey that I'm going to do next week. Oh, wow. For, um, I don't want to necessarily call it a Christmas episode, but it did happen during <laughs> Christmas time. It's like Die Hard. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So, but those are the kind of the things that they can expect when they come to listen to the jury room. That's awesome. And is your goal of the jury room to learn what these criminals did wrong so that you can perform the perfect crime? Absolutely. I mean, why wouldn't <laughs> we want to, right? I'm already, you know, joining the cult. So I might as well add serial killer to the resume too, right? I mean, pretty soon there'll be a podcast on me and why not? (laughs) Well, there'll be someone, like there'll be a copycat who does a podcast on you and then does the same thing. Right, exactly. But they can't do it the same because it's a copycat. You know, it's just... They'll have their own mark. Right, exactly. (laughs) Well, that's awesome. On today's episode of Let's Start a Cult, we will be discussing the Freedomites, also called the Sons of Freedom, and their fight to save their children from the government. The Freedomites were a religious extremist cult that used nudity, arson, and bombing as a shocking form of protest. The self-proclaimed God's people opposed everything from materialism to compulsory education. The Canadian government in turn opposed them. Now, Kevin, have you heard of the Freedomites? I have not, but it sounds like a good time. Anything with nakedness and bombs, I mean, how could you go wrong? (laughs) And Canada. It's a Uh, Canada episode. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. (laughs) Here in America, we have a song. It's called Blame Canada. I mean... Oh, do you actually? Right. You have never seen South Park? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Blame Canada. Blame Canada. Blame Canada, (laughs) right? It's a whole thing, man. Come on. You know what, Josh? I'm taking your Canadian card away now that you don't even know. Oh, no. (laughs) Blame Canada song. Not my social insurance card. (laughs) (laughs) So I figured, you know, I've done America, I've done Japan, Mexico. I figured Canada's turn, you know? Absolutely. About time. We've gotten off (laughs) scot-free. So in the 17th and 18th century Russia, a group of Christians known as Dokobor, or spirit wrestlers, began to separate from the Russian Orthodox Church. Dokobors believed that religion should extend past the Bible. They practiced looking inward, believing that they would find Christ within themselves. Interesting. Pretty nice uh, gesture, I guess. I don't I, know. <laughs> God's always within though, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is how every cult starts. They break away from the church and... it's Right. They can do it better, even though this church has been around for centuries. Yep. And they're only going to be around for maybe 50 years, but they can do it better, right? They can do it way better. <laughs> In 1826, Tsar Alexander of Russia issued a decree that would force the assimilation of Deboro... De, Debo... Oh, God. <laughs> Dokubers into the Russian Orthodox Church using military conscription. Anyone who refused to abandon their radical beliefs and rejoin the church would be sent to the army. As danger mounted for the Dokubor, 
who were raided, beaten under the order of the empire, Russia finally decided to rid themselves of the group entirely. So they're not being treated very nicely. Obviously, I mean, it's Russia. So right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, how well could they be treated? Yeah. And it's poor Russia, too. Like, it, this right. is before they became a superpower. Right. So... In 1897, the Russian government granted Dokubors permission to emigrate from Russia. They were forced to do so at their own expense and were forbidden to ever return to their home country. Get them out of here. We don't want them anymore. Basically exiled. Get them. Yes. Yeah. Which Eh. is always a weird thing. Like, I've never understood countries doing that. (laughs) Hey, you, you can't be here anymore. You have to go. You believe in a different kind of religion than me. That's... Very similar, but just a little bit too far. <laughs> Get Here's out of here. the line, and you <laughs> tiptoed over it. Now you got to go. You've crossed the line here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so Canada, you know. Of course. Offered religious refugees aid and land to settle on. So they're just like, hey, you guys can come here. We got land. We got tons of land. Fuck. No one's using it. Come in here. And by 1899, 600 Dokubors had made the trek to the Great White North. And by 1930, 8,780 members of the religious group had arrived there. So, like, I mean, Saskatchewan's not very big. So that's a big, big chunk of the population. Is that close to you or no? Uh, Saskatchewan is not close to me. No, that's on the other side, huh? Yeah, it's like in the middle of Canada, I guess, kind of. It's the prairies. It's not much going on there. It's a lot of farm, very flat land. So Farms? I thought it snowed 24-7, 365 days a year. (laughs) But uh, it does not. It, <laughs> it does get cold there, though. Saskatchewan is cold. It's like minus 40 with the wind chill. And Is that minus 40 Fahrenheit or is that minus 40 Celsius? Celsius, which I have no idea what translates to Fahrenheit. <laughs> it's ungodly. It's like, I think it's like two and a half or three to one or something like that. I don't know. Because it's yeah. like when you guys are like 27 degrees Celsius, I think it's like 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Right. So... No, Celsius for sure, because uh, I think they'd be dying if it was minus 40 <laughs> Fahrenheit. So these, these Dokubur built 42 villages in the Saskatchewan community of Swan River. The villages had comfortable homes, horses, cattle, and even telephones. Most of these people had been peasants in Russia, and their new lifestyle felt luxurious and exciting. They believed that they had moved to a country of total acceptance, where they could live in peace without government control. They worked as lumbermen, farmers, and carpenters, and they even sent their children to school, an option they simply never had in Russia. Pretty good life so far. Not bad. They're starting out good, right? But, I mean, if if their life was good, we wouldn't be talking about them, right? Yeah, they lived happily ever after. That was it. (laughs) Okay, podcast (laughs) over. Thanks for coming. Josh, you've been great. Let's go. Let's pack it in. Uh, Give your shout out, your plug. Uh, (laughs) Still, the Dokubor's new home wasn't a paradise to everyone. Many were disturbed and disgusted by their people's new draw to affluence. They feared that materialism would corrupt their values. These people, led by Peter Virgin, or Lordy, as his followers called him, of course, set up their set their animals free, abandoned their telephones, and set off to warm their own entirely separate community on agricultural compounds. This marked the beginning of a cult whose stubborn and extremist protests would lead to one of the darkest and cruelest periods in Canadian history. We're going dark. (laughs) <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it's it's always somebody who has to either be called God, Jesus, yeah. Lord, the Almighty, Alpha, Omega. What, I mean, John Froome. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it's got to be something out there. That way they can be, you know, portray themselves to be God. Right. Yeah. And actually, the childish part of my brain saw Peter Virgin and thought it was hilarious that his his name is a euphemism for like dick virgin oh my god you know what's funny you said that and i was like there has to be something funny about that right now and i was more or less just laughing because his last name was virgin virgin I yeah think about that <laughs> it, it just tickled my like four-year-old mind i was like oh god that's funny <laughs> that's hilarious you're a dick yeah. virgin how does that make you feel oh lordy <laughs> oh lordy that's that's the saying for this entire episode. Oh, Lordy. oh, Lordy. Speaking of Lordy, not long after Lordy's followers set off on their own, the Canadian government forced the radicalized Dokubor to register their public land and to own it on an individual basis, destroying their harmonious communal living style. During this time, 5,000 Dokubors lost their land. So 
a huge chunk. Right. No longer own land, which sucks. I mean, I guess it is Christopher Columbus leading this cult. That's what it kind of sounds like. <laughs> Loki Canada was a terrible place <laughs> for anyone who was also was not like Catholic, Christian, white. Right. Further, the government required them to swear an oath of allegiance to Canada. They were wary of pledging allegiances to a country that so far wasn't as accepting of them as they would anticipated. Also, they worried that the oath of patriotism might lead to services in the military, which makes sense coming from where like where they came from. That right. Was, Kind of what they were experiencing. So so it'd be just common sense to be a little bit wary of that. Right. Be like, uh, I don't know about you. Yeah. Mm, I had land and you took it away. Why would I- <laughs> right. Why would I pledge allegiance to that land that you just yeah. took from me? <laughs> Anyone who refused to obey the government's order was relocated to Kootenay, British Columbia, and separated from their community. Most Dokubors, unwilling to uproot their lives yet again, relented. And and just, you know, swore the oath. So they pretty much fought them just to say yes. So, well, there was a, quite a few that did. I mean, they were just like, they don't want to move again. Right. However, those who did not relocate called themselves the Freedomites. Uh, ah. Freedomites. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Freedomites did everything they could to separate themselves from their new country's culture. They believed in community over independence and vehemently opposed materialism, including land owning. Freedomites were perhaps most famous for organizing nude protests. <laughs> with that Peter Virgin, see? <laughs> with the Peter Virgin. Because they believed clothing was offensive to God, who had built the human body from his own image. And it was blasphemous to cover up what the Lord Almighty had created. So. <laughs> All right. That's, I, that checks out. I mean, it's got cults have to check some kind of weird box, right? This is starting to make sense now. This is their weird box, yeah. <laughs> So they would like parade through the streets nude just to bring attention to their cause, which I'm sure they got quite a bit of attention doing. Do you think it was like one of those hashtag free the nipples kind of movement or is it (laughs) like just they're just like, fuck it, we're taking our clothes off? I think it was probably more of a movement where they're like, people shouldn't wear clothes because God, this is God, what God looks like. So you should let it out. (laughs) For some reason, whether God's out there or not, I don't think he looks like a naked human body, but uh, it's just me though. Yeah. He's always portrayed in robes and stuff like that. He's probably got something underneath. I mean, it's probably going to like chafe him or something with that robe rubbing up against him. Right. I mean, yeah. gets a little breezy, you know? (laughs) The outbreak of World War I meant military training was being introduced in public schools, something that horrified the pacifist Freedomites. In response, they pulled their children from the schools, citing religious reasons. They were exempt from joining the military. This was much to the dismay of the soldiers who had put their lives at risk fighting for the country. In 1917, the Russian Revolution sparked a paranoia throughout Canada that the Freedomites and Dokubors might be communist spies. That's like a common theme during that time, though, right? Like everybody thought everybody was a communist. Uh, was this was it a big thing back in like 1917? Though you said 1917, not 1970s, right? Okay. Well, from like it was like the 20s, which is pretty close to 1970. I don't know if you know a lot about like film history here in America or not, but back in the day, there was that fear of communism, that fear that everybody was like you know trying to praise China and, you know, these big communist nations. Right. Like the dictatorship and stuff like that. I don't know if that was something that was also, you know, prevalent in Canada at the same time. You know what I mean? I would imagine so because, I mean, throughout history, Canada's kind of been a tied to America. <laughs> We're like the I little brother. I don't understand why. It's not like we share a border or anything. <laughs> or like military alliances and packs and Right. Yeah, I think the paranoia was kind of weird, though, because these people have lived there for decades and right. the Rus- Russian revolution's happening now. Why would you be concerned <laughs> that these people are the uh, spies or whatever you think they are? Plus, they're overthrowing the Russian government. Why would Not they? the Canadian government. Yeah, why would they even bother with it? <laughs> I didn't understand that part. But it, this is just to show that things are heating up between the government and this group. And it actually goes another step forward because that same year, Peter Lordy Virgin. Virgin, right. <laughs> oh, Lordy Virgin. Peter Lordy Virgin. He died in an explosion that same year. So Freedomites obviously suspected that the government was involved in the explosion that eliminated their leader. So they were furious and they started setting fires to a number of schools in the area. 
protesting not only Lordy's death, but also the public education that they believe would corrupt their children into conformity. Oh, wow. So things are yeah, heating up literally because they're fucking lighting things on fire. So <laughs> <laughs> It's getting hot in here. It's getting hot in here. Take off all your clothes. See, it, hey. it's, a, it's a full circle, That's man. where the song comes from. Damn. <laughs> I'm going to get copyright straight. <laughs> Because me and Nelly are twins, right? That yeah. totally sounded like him. That it yeah, sounded absolutely. perfectly like her. <laughs> right, exactly. So it's around this time that Lordy's son was sent from Russia to Canada to lead the Freedomites. So I guess he was still in Russia for some reason. Not 100% sure why. All right. But he comes there to Canada and begins to lead the Freedomites. But the new leader is a little bit greedy and apathetic and mortgages his followers' assets and kicked any family that could not pay to the curb. In response, Freedomites set bridges and, and railways ablaze. They tore their clothes off to symbolize all of that had been taken from them. And the Canadian government obviously not taking this well. The new protests were lighting their cities on fire. <laughs> so over 600 Freedomites were arrested and sent to Ocala Prison Farm on Piers Island. The children of the prisoners were institutionalized or taken to orphanages. So entire families were just torn apart, never to be reunited again. So almost not that... I'm relating this cult to anywhere close to Nazis, but basically like a concentration camp in a way where they're just kind of ripping people out of their their homes for their benefit. Yeah. And I mean, it's definitely not to the scale of the Nazis, nor... Of course. Nor to the same brutality. Yeah. Right? And they weren't killed. They were alive. They were just oh, being held prison. Well, that's good. At least they made that. At least they did that. <laughs> but it does seem like a an overcorrection. You know what? It's like... Right. Well, we can't figure out who burned them down. So all 600 of you. Lock Every, them up. Everybody's going. Where instead of, I don't know, trying to resolve the group, like work with the group to figure out some sort of solution there. Like, jail them. <laughs> Sounds like America. <laughs> oh, that's where America got it from. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we taught you. Guys. <laughs> By the 1950s, the children of the prisoners had grown into angry, resentful, and heartbroken adults. In retaliation for the pain that the government had caused them, they refused to pay taxes and send their kids to school and failed to register any births or deaths in their community. They continued to strip off their clothes and set fires to everything from private homes to schools to bridges. Over 400 of these traumatized adults were sent to prison for nudism and arson. <laughs> so they have an MO and they love to stick to it. <laughs> <laughs> but my whole thing is it's kind of like cooking naked, right? Like oh, it's yeah. just everybody knows <laughs> this is not something that you do. Like, you don't do that. If a spark flies off, it's going to land on you. And <laughs> right. But I feel like setting a fire and naked, being naked at the same time, is it's kind of the long, the same thing. Yeah. No? I would agree. Yeah. I mean, I guess they're cold. Maybe they want to be warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they put clothes on, then they'd be warm, right? I mean, it's kind of like, uh, that's crazy, man. I don't understand why they why people go to such extremes for certain things like that. Yeah. And you got to feel bad for them because they're, they are like, they're the orphan children basically of right. these, of their parents who got just locked up. And I mean, this is a example of like, like black people in America, their ancestors were locked up, treated poorly. And you can still see the, the waves of, of what happened today. And this is just a very, obviously smaller version of that, but right. in some ways. Well, reality of bad. it is it's all bad, the same regardless of the, the scale, mm -hmm. of whether it be one person to 5 million people, it doesn't matter. Like yeah. human beings shouldn't be enslaved by other human beings or ripped away from their homes for no reason. Yeah. Whatever the case is, whatever the race is, doesn't matter. White, brown, pink, blue, the purple, doesn't matter. Nobody oh, should have to go Fuck through that. purple people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> You got to include everybody, Josh. This is 2020. It's inclusive, man. I mean, our cult takes in every, anyone. I mean, podcast. Our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you have money, we take you in. Exactly. It's fine. Yeah. So it was around this time that the government decided to take drastic measures. I'm not sure what before was. It wasn't drastic, <laughs> I guess. Uh, <laughs> We've already ripped you from your home and locked you up. But now we're taking drastic no, measures. We're cranking it right. up. They were called Canada's Most Troubled Minority by reporter Simia Holt. Pressure was mounting on the government to do something to stop the dangerous cult in its tracks. In 1953, the British Columbia School Act made state-run education mandatory for children between the ages of 7 and 15. They attempted to get Freedomites to voluntarily send their children to schools, sending school buses to the villages, issuing invitations, and then warnings. In protests, nearly 200 Freedomites paraded naked in front of their school, and 
That was the last straw for the authorities. Every protester was sent to prison, and 104 of their children were forced to internment camps called New Denver Dormitories. And see, that's another, it's like that, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like they're re-educating, right? Like yep. it's almost like a, not necessarily brainwashing them, but they're, you know, trying to change their mentality, right? Well, and a big thing actually that Canada was doing at this time was residential schools for Native Americans. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know how much you know about them, but Canada was worse than America for what they were doing. They were just kidnapping kids, forcing them into these religious schools right? and just abusing sexually, physically, mentally. Right. And it was awful. So this is very much on that same vein of, hey, we don't know how to deal with you. So we're going to make you like us. Yeah, exactly. Right. We're, we're going to make you conform one way or the other. And it's just sad. That is sad. That that's just goes back to that, you know, that nobody, no one should have had to ever go through something like that. No, exactly. And no one should. Right. Ever. So diving into the new Denver dormitories, they were described in a 1957 McLean's article, quote, the new Denver dormitories consists of a converted sanctuarium, annex and gymnasium. The buildings are on a lot 200 yard square surrounded on all sides by high steel wire fences. The fourth side faces beautiful Slocan Lake with magnificent mountains towering up from the opposite bank. The approach to the dormitory is guarded by two sets of gates with signs announcing closed area and trespassers will be prosecuted. From Friday to Monday, guards patrol the floodlit gate area 24 hours a day. Other days, they're on duty only at night. Guards on night duty are armed as a precaution against incendiarism. Incendiarism? Sure. I think that's like... Them trying to break out, right? Is that kind of what I'm guessing? Oh, okay. I was thinking fire, but <laughs> <laughs> the Son building that houses older children, although spotless, is dreary. The sleeping section is cold and barn like. Each occupant has a white metal bed, two cupboard drawers, and a steel locker. The dining hall is an unattractive frame roof where children eat at long tables. The atmosphere is impersonal and instant. Inconstitutional or institutional, sorry. It was also probably inconstitutional. <laughs> hey, I would definitely go that it's going against some constitution somewhere. I would almost guarantee it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how McLean's article describes it. Not a pleasing sight other than the mountains. The mountains sound nice. Right. I mean, hey, go to prison with your mountain view. <laughs> that's Canada. <laughs> Blame Canada. See it, Josh, we're on to something. Blame Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Life for children in the new Denver dormitory was bleak at best. The thought of the Canadian government was that the children there would be conformed to modern society and after their stay, which would last until they turned 15, might abandon their unconventional beliefs altogether. School instructor Nielsen Allen said, quote, When the children leave after eight years, they'll no longer be sons of freedom. They'll be Canadians, unquote. Instead, the dormitory traumatized children and their parents and pushed them further away from any shred of allegiance to Canada. Because what the fuck do you expect? <laughs> right. I'd almost rather go back to fucking Russia at that point. I'd be like, I've never even been there, but I'm going there. Yeah, you're like, at least I can go to fucking, I can go to the war. Like, I can go join the right. military. <laughs> Get three hot meals a day shit. Yeah, exactly. On January 18th, 1955, the government performed their biggest raid, known as Operation Kristova. Seventy police officers raided the village of Kristova in the middle of the night while families were sleeping. They successfully removed 40 children from their homes. They wanted to take more, but the Department of Health only approved a maximum of 50 children. So they're also bad at math. They got 40 and they're like, oh, we can only do 50. It's like, yeah, that's a bigger number. You can take more. <laughs> You can still take more. 10 plus 4, 40 is 50. 10 plus 4 is 50. That makes sense, right? Also, it's kind of weird that the Department of Health is like 50. 50 is your limit. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> Not 51. <laughs> How did you come up with this number? <laughs> the raids were harrowing for Freedomite families. The parents and children did not separate without a fight. According to McLean's quote, At the Edakov home, 12-year-old Johnny ran out the back door half-clad, pursued through the snow by two policemen. He escaped. Later, his father found him under a tree, shivering and crying. He carried him to his neighbor's home where the police picked him up, unquote. In another instance, a mother disrobed in protest when the police tried to take her daughter. She fainted. 
By the time she awoke, her daughter had been taken to the dormitory in the back of a police car. I mean, I gotta think that these people that keep taking their clothes off around their children, I mean, they gotta be fucking scarred, right? Like, not <laughs> only are they getting ripped from their house, but they have to watch their parents get naked all the time. Like, that's their, that's, fucked that's up. their last image of their parents is them being... <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Mom! And the last oh, thing you no. see is their titties in your face or something stupid. Oh, God. That's terrible. I didn't even think of that. (laughs) No, it's still nothing I want to be a part of. No, 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 absolutely not. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So the Freedomites lamented that, quote, in some raids, police have manhandled grandfathers and grandmothers, called the women whores, abused the children, and dragged them off without allowing their mothers to say goodbye to them, unquote. The long days and years spent at the new Denver dormitory were joyless and scary to the children who lived there. They saw their parents once a month through the high wire fence. According to McLean, quote, The parents stand on the other side of the fence. The children begin singing prayers and songs of welcome, often with tears in their eyes. After 20 minutes, the singing ends and both groups range themselves along the fence. Some are trying to kiss through the fence through the wire mesh. Others look silently at each other, tears running down their cheeks. Bundles of food and clothes are passed over the fence to children while half a dozen RCMP officers look on, unquote. Uh, Pretty bleak. Right. For the parents, it's got to be, like, could you imagine, like, being a parent and your kid's basically in jail? Right. For no reason. Well, I guess in this, like, it's it's from your lifestyle, from your your choices, like, your kids are being punished for it, which is not fair to you either because I mean, it's not obviously not their fault right. for believing in what they believe well, in. What, well, what they've been taught from the time that they were born, right? It's not like, exactly. they, you know, walked out, you know, saying, Oh, I'm Lordy. Right. Like they were yeah. taught this, you know, over the generations. Yeah. And I mean, if the Canadian government had let them live their life, like their communal lifestyle where they weren't bothering anyone, they're, pacifist for most like for what well, they were pacifist they burn things now but <laughs> where they were just nudist pacifist i think i think it would have been fine like right. it would, they would have been like they would have just been their own community inside of canada and that would have been okay <laughs> right i mean you guys would probably be running around naked by now because it would have just spread throughout the country but hey just let them be, right <laughs> i mean i would not be because i would be way too cold but <laughs> It's not small, I swear, it's just cold. (laughs) (laughs) Besides those bizarre and heart-wrenching monthly visits, children never saw their families. They received no holidays and were not allowed to visit people in New Denver. In one instance, a desperate father sent word to the dormitory that his children's mother was going into life-threatening surgery. He asked if the children could come home to visit with her. The head of the school refused, saying, we're not going to let these children go running home for nothing. Oof. Oh, all right. So your mother dying is nothing to these people. Yeah, yeah, that that doesn't mean shit. Doesn't matter. (laughs) And from 1956 to 1959, the director's monthly notes reported that common consequences for misbehavior was lost family visits and switches. Well, switches also back in like the old old time was like a a whip. At least that's what I'm thinking it might be. Yeah, that's so. So yeah, so they would just punish them by. Taking away family visits or whipping them, probably, yeah. Uh, I mean, even if it's wrong, it still sounds right because, yeah. I mean, they're already locking the kids up for, <laughs> for their it, beliefs anyways, right? Yeah, it tracks, which is not, <laughs> which is the point of this, yeah. <laughs> right. Parents finally agreed to take an oath, promising to send their children to school. And with that, the children were released and reunited with their families on August 2nd, 1959. I guess we're all happy, go lucky, we're good again. Yeah. We <laughs> make it arsonists now. Yay. And actually, in the following years, the Freedomites, suffering from trauma from the years past, continue to fight against the government. Their protests grew more violent. Bombings were more commonplace. And in the early 60s, the group bombed the Canadian Pacific Railway. They destroyed public property and burned buildings to the ground. Members were arrested in the hundreds. In 1963, one Freedomite died in an explosion of his own bomb. Oh, Lordy. Well, (laughs) (laughs) to be fair, yeah, he might have died from his own bomb. Who knows? Well, didn't he, though? I thought he died, like, uh, in a fire or a bomb. He died from an explosion, but it wasn't clear the circumstances. Oh, I So the Freedomites just blamed the government, blamed Canada. 
<laughs> see, blame can't see. That's you need to have that's that's your background music for this episode. Just blame Canada. Just blame Canada. <laughs> right. So they're they're not happy, obviously. Well, I don't know why the government would think, hey, we've just enslaved, right? In a way, yeah. these people for years on end, these kids from their ch- from their parents, the parents from their children, and they release them and everybody's just supposed to be a big happy family. I don't <laughs> I don't see that happening. Get along. Right. Like us now. <laughs> In the early 1980s, following four decades of violent protests, British Columbia officials organized the expanded Kootenai Committee on Intergroup Relations. The mission of this group is to bring together representatives of various Dokabor groups, governmental departments, and police to come up with a way for freedomites and Canadians to peacefully coexist. Which the irony is if they had done this in the goddamn first place, none of this would have happened. <laughs> right. We wouldn't be having a podcast about the Freedom Knights right now. Exactly. Today, only a few people identify as Freedomites. There are nearly 20,000 active Dokubors in Canada. 2,500 are descendants of the Sons of Freedom. The children of New Denver Dormitory, now adults, formed an organization called the New Denver Survivor Collective. Members of the group spoke to British Columbia Legislature in 2004, asking for an official apology from the government. Instead, Attorney General Jeff Plant delivered a statement of regret on behalf of British Columbia. I'm sure that went over well, right? I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay (laughs) that you hit me and that you're going to hit me tomorrow, but we're good today. I actually have the statement right here, and I'm going to read it for you. (laughs) Quote, We've recognized that a chapter in this province's history needs to be acknowledged. More than 50 years ago, 104 sons of Freedom Dokabor children were removed from their parents during a period of protest in the West, Kootenays. These children, who were not allowed to return home during Christmas or summer breaks for the years that they were living in the new Denver dormitories, visited by parents were restricted to two weekends a month, I have no doubt that the New Denver experience affected these children and their families in profound ways since they were kept from their parents for lengthy periods of time, unquote. So he's basically like, hey, I acknowledge that that probably sucked. (laughs) (laughs) And there's probably going to be lasting effects, but maybe not at the same time. Yeah. And the statement also failed to recognize that there were around 175 children in the dormitories, not 104 also, there were no mention of the abuse or terrible conditions the kids were in or, or like were right. forced to endure. There were no mentions of the violent separation of the sobbing children in the back of police cars or the mothers who didn't get to see their kids grow up. So basically a blanket, I'm sorry statement. <laughs> right. Hey, I'm sorry I kicked you in the face. But yeah. I'm not going to say that I kicked you in the face. I'm just going to say that I slapped your hand. Fine. It's good. <laughs> we're good. Everything's good. Not even apologize, because it's not even really an apology. It's kind of just acknowledging that it happened, which is... Right, which is not the same as apologizing. Yeah, and this is this is a whole rant I've got. I've never understood why governments or people of a country are opposed to apologizing for something that... Like, it might not have been you directly, because you, right. like, you can just say, hey, I'm sorry, my ancestors did this. It was really shitty. How can I help? Like... Right. How is it how is it that hard to be like, hey, I acknowledge that and and I apologize for these terrible things that we've done. How can we help improve going forward and make make a change? Like I've never understood why that was so what would you call it? Like a like against your core being or like somehow it's saying you're a terrible person. Right. I think it's kind of one of those things that they would have to acknowledge their faults, right? It's kind of like right. You can almost equate it to like the legalization of marijuana, right? Like in a way, like I know Canada, right? It's finally, you know, completely 100% legal, right? Yeah. Well, obviously here in the States, it's not. And it's still a schedule one, Mm -hmm. which means that you can still go to federal prison, right? For it. So in a way, I kind of look at it the same way as it's like, if they acknowledge that they made a mistake, then they have to go and fix their mistakes. Everything, right. Everything that was the cause of whatever they did, you know, up until that point that they acknowledge, you know. Right. So I think it's one of those things that, you know, it's a, I think it's, well, it's obviously it's a pride thing too, Mm -hmm. but if they've already, you know, put out these statements and, you know, saying no, no, no. And then all of a sudden they're like, yes, we fucked up. Yeah. I'm sorry. You know, it's like one of those almost in a sense where, 
you would probably get a group of people that would try to take over the government because they're weak, right? Even though the strongest position is being able to admit that you made a mistake right? and moving forward, you know, and going forward a different direction. You got to think doubling down is definitely not the way to go because then that just creates more of the issues. So that's, right. some, I guess it's p- passing the buck, right? You're just like, oh, I don't have to admit to it. Maybe some other government like guy will do it or girl will do it later on. Right. Yeah, it's shitty. And I mean, I, I do hope the government comes out with a better statement sometime soon. Cause this was like, what, when was this? This was 2004. So, Oh <laughs> yeah. So it's still, we're, we're like way ahead of, oh man, yep. that's so sad. Yep. So to bring it all to a conclusion, the Freedomites battle with the Canadian government remains controversial to this day. While violence committed by the supposed pacifist group was certainly dangerous and wrong, it is hard to believe that the government could not come up with a better solution than to snatch children and place them in internment camps. Today, the children who suffered in their most formative years at the hands of strangers who detested them are just trying to live normal lives, and they are still waiting for an apology. So are they still around now then? Yeah, yeah, the the doc, uh, yeah, there's still a community of um, not freedomites or or sons of freedom, but the do, do, docobors or yeah, the docobors, they're still around. There's still a community of docobors, pretty big. I think it said yeah, twenty thousand active back in two thousand four. So oh wow, okay. So yeah, it's it's grown into quite a community of in BC and Saskatchewan, and Alberta. I'm sure. Yeah, so a uh, very sad story, very sad halt. I wouldn't. <sighs> And it's hard to be like on the cult side in most situations, but you got to kind of think that the cult isn't quite to blame here. I wouldn't even necessarily, I now this is just my opinion, right? Like if you listen, listen to the story and take in all the information, like in a way, I don't feel like it got a chance to become a cult necessarily. Right. Right. Like they absolutely had the the precursors to become a cult you know that Mm -hmm. communal communal living and all that but i mean the reality of it is how much of their violence and anger and everything came from the government i mean i'd be pissed off as fuck if you're coming into my house messing my shit up and taking my kids like that's Mm -hmm. gonna piss me off yeah, of course I'm gonna blow shit up and light your shit on fire. Maybe not naked, but I'm still <laughs> gonna, fucking, you know, like if I have the access to that stuff, that's what I'm doing. And there has to be like there is a dis- distinct difference between the Dokubor and the Freedomites because there is like the Freedomites came from the Dokubor, but the Dokubor themselves were pretty much they were very pacifist and they were just living in their communities. Mm-hmm. The Freedomites were a bit more pushy with their protests, like they were the nudist in the street. And, right. But you could easily just be like, tell them, hey, well, I don't even know. Like, why Why do people care if someone else is nude in the street? I get like. Right. I get it kids. if you're in like, OK, a major city or yeah. if you're, you know, your whole communal has surrounded a school and you're all are flapping your dicks everywhere. I get like, <laughs> OK, I get that. Right. But yeah. if they are living out literally in the middle of nowhere, mm-hmm. you know, living off the land and they're choosing to teach their their values and their values are we're going to be naked like because that's god (laughs) then i don't i don't see a problem with that like because they're out in the middle of nowhere they're not messing with nobody they're not hurting anybody yep well and i think they would have been probably for the most part fine if they like yeah you had the freedomites and you probably could have just dealt with them separately because they left anyway so if they were if they became violent eventually dealt with them but you forced them to become violent and then dealt with them terribly, including the Dokubors in their, their arson and stuff like that, and then pushed the Dokubors to become violent. And it's just, it just spiraled into this big thing that could have been easily avoided by a allowing them to keep their land and b focusing on the right fucking group instead of the entire (laughs) group and just blaming them all. (laughs) Right. Right. So yeah, it's sad, sad story and a cult that, yeah, like you said, probably didn't develop into what it could have been, but it, it had it had the markings. I mean, like you said, it, it, they split off. They became two separate groups. And, you know, like you said, they should have left cult light alone yep. and just fucked with the people that were, you know, that were creating the chaos. Exactly. Well, that's the Freedomites. I mean, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I know it was sad, but 
there's very few cult episodes that are happy. So <laughs> I don't, I don't think you're ever going to have a happy cult episode. Uh, the John Froome one, I, I would say it wasn't sad necessarily. It was kind of, it was fine. They were just kind of, they believed in some American dude who <laughs> bring them cargo. It was pretty wholesome, I guess. <laughs> pretty. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin, for coming on. If if you guys are listening, definitely go check out the Jury Room podcast. Where can they where can they find your podcast? Kevin? Oh, dude, everywhere, all over eight billion <laughs> podcasting platforms that are out there. I so still, for the life of me, can't figure out why there's so many. But whatever, we all play the same game, right? <laughs> exactly. Jury Room podcast, pretty much anywhere and everywhere. Uh, like review, iTunes, Spotify, and Audible. I'm you know I'm trying to spread the word about Audible. I just found that out the other day something for you to check into i'm pretty sure yours is on there i think awesome. when i looked the other day your yours was on there so but yeah just like review anywhere there's show notes there's uh i leave feedback links down in the the show notes so that way if you don't necessarily want it to be public i create forms for every episode uh that only i see so then that way oh. you don't have to you know put it out in the public very cool. You could tell me that I suck or you could tell me that I'm great. <laughs> either way. I mean, either way, I want to hear it all right. It helps. It only helps us get better or it reiterates that, hey, you're doing the right thing. Right. So. Right. But no, other than that, man, thanks for having me on. I, I've never heard of this one. This is something <laughs> I haven't heard of. So that's always my goal is to find a weird one that no one's heard of other than Heaven's Gate and Jonestown. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, yeah. Wait, like nobody's heard of those though. You're good. Like they're under the radar, but yeah, uh, totally under the radar. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely go check out Jury Room Podcast and give give Kevin some love. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so at let's underscore cult. Same as Instagram. We have a Facebook page. If you guys want to, you know, send me cult uh, requests, like to do them, I, I'll, I'm all ears all the time. And uh, yeah. Thanks for coming on, Kevin. Hey, put your clothes back on, Josh. <laughs> I'm actually repping the cult merch. Oh, there you go. I was plug. wondering about that. I saw plug. that. Yeah. That's nice. That's beautiful. Hey, where's mine? Oh, man. I got to. No, yeah. Is this going to be. I got to pay my guests to come on. I guess on the merch. Right. I mean, Damn. hello. I'm paying you. <laughs> You're my leader. I should get something out of this. You get the confidence that you'll go to heaven. Oh, well, they sign me up. I want five. Whatever heaven is in your belief. If it- right. <laughs> heavens with you josh wherever you are wow Wow. that's awesome (laughs) that's the tagline now (laughs) all things culty with josh in heaven i love it it's awesome i'll just have you be my producer you can come up with that let's do it let's go all right well i appreciate you having on kevin and uh, i appreciate uh, all the fred listening out there and uh, we'll see you next time take care